Akmesa is a game so deep in a fantasy world that your father not only wants to return with the milk, he also promised you an arranged marriage with a hot freak woman that should forever look like she's in her prime. The only downside is that she'll probably stab you in the back on her first opportunity. This game is also directly connected to the main Might and Magic lore. I will not dare enter this rabbit hole in this video, however, I will superficially comment about it for the sake of context. You can perfectly understand this game's story with only the information the writers give you. It is even more interesting to do so, because it's kind of the same situation the protagonist finds himself into. Dark Messiah is an action RPG developed by Arkane Studios and published by Ubisoft in 2006. The story of Arkane Studios would be one of the most tragic ones if they closed doors right now. It started with a developer that did not want his games to be just another bland product. He wanted his games to feel like something unique for the player, and for most of its story, Arkane Studios managed to achieve this objective. Until events out of their control forced the studio to make exactly what its founders wanted to avoid. All of this just works. You probably know them for Dishonored 1 and 2, Prey, Deathloop, and Redfall. But these are the titles most people know about, with Prey being the most underground of them. However, let's focus now on the two first titles of the studio, Arx Fatalis and Dark Messiah of Might and Magic. Arx Fatalis was released in 2002 and brought a lot of interesting ideas to the table. The focus on the combat and player experience was the main reason for the high score this game managed to achieve. Unfortunately, a good game cannot exactly be considered a success if we don't talk about sales. This was Arkane's first game, and they could not make a giant marketing plan for it by themselves. This is where a publisher would enter and take care of this part. The ideas they brought to the table were very interesting, but it was a new studio, with no games under its belt, meaning their portfolio did not look at very promising to the eyes of the big publishers of the time, despite most people working on it being very experienced developers. Due to this, Arx Fatalis ended up being a failure in sales, but managed to have high review scores. I have never played it, but everyone I know that have played it considers it a hidden gem. Thankfully, all the hard work Arkane invested into Arx Fatalis was not all for nothing. This brought them the attention of some really big publishers, one of them being Ubisoft, who at the time was looking for a studio to develop their next title, Dark Messiah of Might and Magic. Recently, I scrubbed my two last brain cells together to come to the genius conclusion that putting the call to action at the end of a video this size would not work very well. So let's try a more aggressive approach. Please consider liking and subscribing. You have 20 seconds to comply. Dark Messiah has one of the most unique combats for its time. By what I could notice, this is due to the level of detail of the animations and how well done the hitboxes of enemies was made. But what really brings the combat to another level is the amount of different options the game gives you. Of course, you can just go old school and repeatedly introduce your enemies to the pointy part of your sword, which is also very fun. But the moment you decide to test the different options of combat creativity the game delivers you, there is no turning back. If you ever play this game, you know I'm talking about the kick mechanic and the interactive environment. The kick mechanic turns the F key into an instant dopamine release button during the fights. You can use it to break enemies' defense stances, push them downstairs, push them over cliffs, push them into spikes, or push them into whatever objects present in the arena. On the matter of interactive environment, I'm referring to the objects you can throw at your enemies and the traps you can use in your favor. Depending on the key you press, Seraph does a different attack. For example, if you are using a sword and press the key to go forward, together with the attack button. Seraph will try to stab his enemy while he takes a small jump ahead. As I said, the fighting animations are also very well made, but you can only feel this because of how much attention they have given to the enemy's hitboxes. That is, if you are fighting against the humanoid enemies. I can only remember right now two types of enemies that don't enter this category, the spiders and the dragons. Speaking of which, this game throws spiders at you every time it gets bored. I mean, it makes sense if you consider what's happening in the story of the game, but more than once I've seen people drop in this game because of them. Whenever I asked why, they said it's due to how well their moving animation was made. They can crawl on walls and on the ceiling, which is something we usually not see happening in games. And there is also their attack animation that looks as if they were the face huggers from Alien. Thinking about this, I left a link of a mod in the description where the spiders will be turning to pigs and they will not be able to attack you. Honestly, this is a minor change. Fighting against them is boring. As I said, it makes sense for them to be there, but they are definitely one of the weakest parts of the game. The mod does not affect the queen, but she don't even look like a spider and is very easy to kill. 
I can't believe I'm saying this, but fighting dragons is also one of the worst parts of the game. They just hover over you, as if you're playing a 3D knockoff Space Invaders. They don't wait that much in my opinion of this game, because we will encounter only 3 of them. As you complete quest objectives and kill enemies, you will acquire experience points to level up your abilities. The game does give you some amount of freedom to build up your own class, but the best thing you can do is stick to one of the 3 main classes, Warrior, Wizard or Rogue. I played the game as a warrior and was not disappointed, but I did invest some points at stealth and had a sip of the rogue class, and it's very cool to see the game allows you a full stealth playthrough, killing enemies one by one, hiding in the shadows, hiding bodies, going on a path that is upwards the arena and no one can see you, or paths that are completely optional, and serve specifically for a stealth run. If you play at Zoners, you can see that almost all of the major fundamentals of the game are present here. Actually, while trying to solve the spider problem, I found myself into the game settings code. There, I saw that the developers even made a sound mechanic based on the type of ground you are stepping at the moment. For example, if you are stepping on bones, the chance of alerting enemies is higher than if you are stepping on stone. Speaking of sound, they used some from the same library Crusaders of Might and Magic used. This might be a very long shot and most certainly wrong but there is a chance they were inspired by the combat mechanics of Crusaders of Might and Magic. I'm saying this because it falls into the exact same thing Arcane was trying to accomplish, a Might and Magic, fully 3D, action RPG. If they did were inspired by the combat of Crusaders, which is understandable, the combat in Crusaders is one of the things that works very well, this would mean that Dishonored, a game that massively influenced the industry, could be linked to Crusaders of Might and Magic, because Dark Messiah, the game that devs used as basis for Dishonored, has some inspiration coming from there. A nice argument, Senator. Why don't you back it up with a source? My source is that I made it the fuck up! The game begins with our character, Seraph, exploring what seems to be an ancient temple, where an artifact called the Shantiri Crystal is located. Seraph is the apprentice of a wizard called Fenrig and he wants to prove himself worthy of his master's training. This is the tutorial of the game, and it does a great job at two things. First, presenting you its unique assets like the kick and environmental interactivity. And another more subtle one, like the fact that there will always be someone talking to you on the passenger seat. If you fuck around in parts like this, this game will call you out. I really like when games keep track of this type of thing. Like I said, the focus of the developers was in the player experience. They also give us the spell Dark Vision almost right out of the gate. This spell does not consume mana, takes a long time to wear off, and can be used immediately after it does. As you probably deduce from the name, it allows you to see in the dark, and we will be using it a lot. It does sound like it's a feature added in the last minute after the devs have seen that the game was too dark, but I'm not complaining about it. In game, it makes sense for it being this dark, and it also makes sense that Seraph knows the spell, being a wizard apprentice and all. Some people might disagree with me on this one, but I don't think casting spells in this game is very fun, at least not the ones we get until the mid-game. We are then introduced to the Black Guards, by far one of the most common enemies of the game. Right now, facing a lot of them heads first is a death sentence, so try killing them one by one as fast as you can. Kicking any enemy into one of these spikes is a guaranteed insta-kill. Unfortunately, I am as dense as they come, so it took me a long while to actually start using this mechanic. This is the type of tutorial I can't exactly complain about. It makes sense for Seraph to be tutored by Fenrir, taking into account this is his first mission, and what happens in the tutorial actually helps with the storytelling. The game could just throw us into Stonehelm with the Shantiri crystal, and then give some excuse for us to have a tutorial. What I did here was simple, but I will consider it to be an extra mile. After acquiring the crystal, Fenrir gives Seraph a new quest and presents us to one of the main characters of the game. Needless to say, this one character is considered to be a fan favorite by most people. I am not sending you alone. You'll need a guide, a companion, perhaps even a guardian. She may even teach you a few other things. What is your bidding, my master? One can travel lighter than two, Sarah. Am I too? Protect this boy. <sighs> Fear not. This won't hurt a bit. Shh. By the way, my name is... 
Sana will always be present inside Seraph's mind, constantly giving us advice, making some sassy comments, and trying to seduce Seraph in every chance she gets, no matter the situation. The approach should be clear. Your pretty little friend can come on board without becoming a pretty little pincushion. I'll just lower the pretty little gangplank then. Seraph. Who or what Xana is, is one of the mysteries of the game that is directly linked to Seraph. Even at this point it's quite obvious what she is, but it's nice to see how the story presents itself. After being charged with the mission of going to the free city of Stonehelm and giving the Shantiri crystal to the local wizard lord, Menelag, the actual first chapter of the game begins. On this next scene, we see Seraph arriving in Stonehelm. We also see many people agitated at the entrance. And by overhearing their comments, we are informed that an army of necromancers is marching through the city. Seraph gives some documents to the guard at the entrance seconds before said necromancer army reaches the city. I like this scene not for what happens in it. After all, a city being attacked in the beginning of a RPG is literally one of the most used cliches of the genre. I like this scene for how the devs chose to give us the whole backstory of what's happening without having the usual lore dump we would have in most games. But not only that. We hear people commenting that no one really knows where they are, giving us a hint that they have someone no way of transporting a whole army. At first, this could seem like a minor thing, but if these guys were not here to foreshadow what happens next, this whole scene will feel like a huge and then, without any further context. Seraph and Xana even comment about it in the case the player is not paying attention. A guard drags Seraph inside the city walls, from there, we can go into the main entrance and see that an undead cyclops is destroying the gate. We enter what seems to be some stables, and from there, we are able to reach the citadel walls. This right here is one of the major critics the game had at the time. This game is more unstable than that one girl with the colored hair you had a crush in high school. Remember to spam the save button every time you can. Jokes aside, Ubisoft is the one who holds the rights for the game and its IP, so they are the ones who should maintain it after so much time. This game is almost 18 years old and still holds the same problems of its release. I was getting ready to lash out at Ubisoft, but I just discovered they greenlighted a group of modders that were asking for permission to try and better the game. This is a huge show of goodwill on Ubisoft's side. I will leave the link of both the modders YouTube page and ModDB page in the description if you are interested in supporting their work. After restarting the game, we finally made our way into the citadel walls, we close a particular to stop the ghouls from coming in, and one of the guards asks for our help operating one of the ballistas, which we used to kill the undead cyclops that breached into the city. Now that the necromancer's attack is over, we descend into the city, and as expected of a city that is soon to be under siege, we see that people are getting desperate, and the streets are crowded with guards. This segment at first feels like filler, but it helps building up the atmosphere of the game, also, it rewards the player with items, books, or some extra dialogue if we decide to explore. What are you waiting for? Out! You really have a way with women, don't you? Fuck it. Fuck it. I'll do it myself. In Menelag's mansion front gate, we encounter his niece, Liana. Liana and Seraph have a very brief interaction, and both of them are giving each other the eye, if you know what I mean. Welcome to the house of Menelag. We're bang, okay? Later in the video, I will elaborate further on why both of these characters are immediately in horny mode right after knowing each other. This dinner scene is kind of strange at first because of the camera positioning. It looks like Seraph is either a really tall guy that don't know how to speak with people shorter than him, or that Seraph is an idiot that is trying to look at the ceiling instead of looking at the person he's trying to talk to. Maybe passing so much time alone with horses instead of people was not very good for his social skills. Menelag presents himself and comments about the School of Shadows, the artifact we came here to retrieve. Right after this, Liana says that we should be careful of a man called Arantir, because he might be the Dark Messiah. Arantir is the leader of the Necromancers and main antagonist of the game. He has a whole campaign about him in Heroes of Might and Magic 5. He worships one of the aspects of the goddess Asha, known as the Spider Queen. All three of us know better than that. But the time is right for the prophecy. I'll worry about dusty old prophecies. You worry about the expedition. You're in charge of it, after all. Of course, Uncle. Good night. And to you too, Sarah. Please don't tell me you find that sort of thing cute. Listen well, boy. Here, the dialogue gets kind of clunky. Melek says that he knows about Fenrig's plans and that he don't want Liana getting involved. 
Well, you're in luck. Seraph has no fucking idea what his master's plans are. Plus, if you don't want Liana getting involved, why put her as leader of the expedition? Show you to the guest house. Get some sleep, hero. We sail with the morning tide. On the next scene, one of the servants wakes Seraph in the middle of the night and warns him that the mansion is being attacked. In this first part, we have to find a way to get inside the mansion in order to secure the Shantiri crystal. On many parts here, the level design is very on the nose about the interactive environment. It gives you many obvious opportunities to mess with it, and I think this was a good choice on part of the devs. It's one of the most unique features the game has to offer, and because we are not accustomed to see this type of thing, maybe the players would end up forgetting about it if they decided to be more subtle about this feature. The inside of Manelag's mansion is one of the most memorable parts of the game. Its design is quite unique, filled with secret doors and hiding spots. It is the one part that most remembered me of Dishonored. Although, some things seem a bit out of place when you stop to consider them, like why Manelag has so many spiked frames scattered around his mansion. At one point, I thought I might find the old man's weird sex dungeon. And I guess Xana was expecting the same thing, because she said this when I found this isolated room. Holy shit! Shortly after, we can hear Manelag being interrogated. I always thought this guy interrogating him was someone important, but no. Manelag gets his school caved in by a ghoul and a random necromancer. He manages to kill the necromancer, but the ghoul flees with the Shanchiri crystal and Liana sends us after him. Yeah, I'm not going to sugarcoat this. I know the climbing in this game was sort of a prototype that Arkane used for the later games, but still, this is by far the worst mechanic in the game. This is the only part you really feel it, because you have to pursue the ghoul through the rooftops, and if you get too far from him, the mission will fail. Meaning that, you can take your time climbing like in other parts of the game. More than once, the game seemed to ignore the inputted commands. I tried to one press the jump button, and then I tried holding the jump button until the climbing animation was over but it had the same result in both times. The chasing segment ends when we enter the city wall. Here is another segment the game is really on the nose about its assets, however, it's focusing on the multiple paths we could follow to complete this part. Our objective here is to enter this old warehouse, you could go right, and enter this trapdoor that will lead you inside the building without fighting the guards. You could try to go left and then climb on the walls in order to have an advantage point where you could use your bow and arrow safely. Or, you could face the guards heads first, while using the interactive environment in your favor. This right here is a lesson in level design. Not only it adds replayability, it is also very fun and engaging to try other possible paths. In the underground of the warehouse, we encounter this forge that will serve as an introduction to the weapons crafting. In truth, I don't think I can say this is a relevant system for the game in general. This will only be relevant 2 out of 3 times we find a forge, one to forge the long sword using a steel bar, and other to forge an earth fire sword using a fire goat bar. The earth fire sword is useful against spiders because it causes fire damage, but it's not a very good sword in general, when you consider its base damage and that a lot of enemies in this game, like orcs and goblins, have fire resistance. Right next to the forge, we can see some planks of wood blocking a secret entrance to a cave. If you go through here, you can skip a good part of the next segment without fighting. With the exception of two small spiders and two guards. Ironically, if you are doing a stealth run, it's more interesting to go downstairs and deal with the more dangerous path, because you'll be able to acquire some nice gear for your rogue class. We keep going through the sewers, until the game presents Aaron Tyr for the first time. He's making some observations about the crystal in front of a strange portal. I think the game does a good work building up Arantir as the antagonist. The only downside to their approach is that if the player don't already know Arantir from Heroes 5 and was not paying attention to some of the conversations in the cutscenes, they could end up not understanding who this guy is supposed to be. We free some prisoners in order to distract Arantir and his men, giving us enough time to steal the crystal and flee through the sewers. After escaping, Seraph has a vision of the last conversation he had with Fenric. I'm sending you to the free city of Stonehelm to meet a sorcerer named Menelag. He and I have certain shared allegiances. Right now, he's looking for an artifact called the Skull of Shadows, for reasons of his own that are doomed to fail. He thinks you're going to help him, the fool. At least not without this. 
the Shantary crystal that we retrieved. However, boy, I don't trust you out there alone. I need someone to hold your leash. One can travel lighter than two, Sarah. Don't worry. You'll learn to enjoy the pain. You can call me Xana. Sarath, wake up. Easy there. What happened? Xana? What's going on? Who? What are you, really? That dream was just a necromancer's curse. Don't believe any of it, dear. I'm a friend. I think the first plan for the scene was for it to be used for something greater, to hint at the player that not everything the game has been showing us is real. Taking on the fact that Seraph has a literal demon in his head, more specifically, a succubus. Xana not being a good entity was never exactly a well hidden fact, so this revelation was not a surprise. However, I think they have lost an opportunity to do something else with the scene. I will elaborate on this right after I finish presenting the segment. At first, I was going to say the scene was too much of a coincidence, because what are the chances Seraph entered the Zexor tunnel that would take him to Melag's ship? But that is another thing that is bothering me much more than this. And that is, the game never specifies Liana's motivation. It's kind of something simple to do to be honest. That's why it bothers me so much. Have a line saying that she wants to avenge her uncle, or that she can't allow Arantir to achieve his goals. Any of these motivations would be enough for this character. Before clearing the path, she tells Seraph that she's relieved that he's okay, and that the necromancers had stolen Menelag's ship. She also tells us that we should not try to approach the ship directly, but I was not paying attention when she said that, and I ended up being pinned by a ballista. At this point, I remember this is an old game, and that we cannot skip cutscenes or dialogues, this is another good motive for not dying. I think it's impressive they have done a whole mechanic in animation that honestly, I think I just used it 3 times in the whole game. This one being the only time I really had to use it. The second time, I was just fucking around, and the third time is completely optional. Taking this and the forge mechanic into account, I think the devs were just having some fun, experimenting with the new possible assets. If you alert the guards in this part, the ballistas will still shoot you. The ship has two entrances, this one and another at the other side of the ship, that I assume is for a stealth run. Inside the ship, we find the black guards we have been fighting the whole game, and two other enemies with one of them being optional. This being the necromancers and the goblins inside the cages. The necromancers are the only type of enemies that can cast magic, but they are not very challenging. Magic in this game kind of sucks. In the late game, they will become more annoying, because they will be able to summon simple zombies, and these zombies can cast clouds of poison. Poison in this game is by far the most tedious effect to deal with. Shortly after the goblin cages, we can find one of the two flame gold bars in the whole game. I finish killing all the enemies in the ship and then lower the gangplank for Liana. You're astonishing, Sarath. I'll free the crew and get the ship ready to sail. Just keep those monsters from getting on board. They won't get past me. Showing off for the other pretty girl, are we? In this part here, we have to deal with waves of enemies. This is not exactly hard to go through, but you have to expose yourself in order to aggro the archers, because Liana wants to show how special she is and stays put in the most open area possible. Just remember that kicking these guys in the water counts as an insta-kill. I mean, it makes sense, they are using heavy armor. However, this is just me making excuses for the game. This same rule does not apply when Seraph is wearing heavy armor. I think that first things first, a game should be fun to play, and this is a clear case where adding balance or fairness probably would bring the quality of the experience down. After this, Liana calls us to talk. Seraph and I will raise the anchor. Your orders, milady. Sarah, could you come with me? It's, um, important. Hmm. 
I'm not good at this. Sarah, when my uncle died, I thought everything was lost. But somehow you managed to get the crystal, the boat. You saved us all. You saved me. I feel nauseous. Wake me when it's over. I, I just wanted to thank you again and, and to tell you that you've become very important to me. Ready to sail. Oh, um, yes. Cast off then, Tergon. Can we get the boat moving? This cabin could use a breeze to clear the hot air. Oh, okay. Her motivation is that she's horny. At this point, it is kind of obvious that Xena represents the evil path of the game and Liana represents the good path. What brings us to a centuries-old question that appears every time more than one woman has a central role in a story. Who is best girl? Xena. They tried their best to make Liana more appealing than her. But you quickly notice that the game was rigged from the start when you begin to consider some things. For example, Xana has so much more interactions and screen time than Liana that she could be reduced to the role of side character and due to this, Liana's romance feels absurdly rushed. You could also say that Xana's romance also feels rushed because she's constantly talking as if she was trying to get into Seraph's pants. And you will be right on this one. However, she is a succubus, you know? A type of demon that uses sex as a manipulation tool, therefore, it makes sense for her to act like that. Be careful with this body, Sarath. I've got uses in mind for it, you know. As for Liana, I think they were trying to make her romance the love at first sight trope. And I think that was a good idea, to use love as an opposition to lust. But Liana's story is so rushed that I think not even the devs trusted it would be enough to convince the player that she is more appealing than Xana. Why I'm saying that, let me answer your question with another question. Do you remember Bioshock Infinite, and more specifically, me, Elizabeth? She had an entire team dedicated to her animations, design, and interactions, plus an excellent voice actress. Xana and Liana received the same treatment in Dark Messiah. Of course, they probably did not have a whole team just to work on them, but all the other elements are present. They have excellent voice actresses and designs. Liana's interactions are not as good or memorable than Xana's. But, they brought her A-game while doing her animations. Unfortunately, I don't see this as a good thing when I take in perspective who this character should be. As Xana's counterpart, Liana should be the more innocent one. And while this is communicated through her interactions and dialogue, her body language often resembles that of a succubus more than the actual succubus. Who, speaking of which, most times has a body language that resembles a wild beast ready to attack its prey. Ironically, I think they did both of them like that to try and make Xana less appealing when compared with Liana. But the joke's on you, Arcane, I'm into that shit. And I know a lot of you guys probably share this opinion with me, because Ubisoft made a whole campaign dedicated to her in Heroes of Might and Magic 6, almost 5 years after Dark Messiah was released. I think the writers could have used a Xana Revelation scene as a way of saying that she's manipulating Seraph's memories in order to have him at her side. This would make sense for Xana, since she's a demon, therefore, deception would be expected of her. And, it would add some conflict to the part of the plot that involves her. I don't want to spoil these scenes, but I will point this out again when the time comes. Than most. Well, well, look who's here. So good of you to join us, Sarah. Do you want to learn about your destiny or your doom? Neither are what you think. He'll learn soon enough. Go on, Leon. Dance with him for as long as he'll allow it. Ah, your first victim. Don't worry, boy. She will be your last. After the boat scene, we arrive at the island where the School of Shadows is kept. Right at the entrance, we encounter some dead expedition guards. One of them is at Death's door and tells us about a Paukai. What the hell is a Paukai, you ask? What's a Paukai? A degenerate dragon. I see, a degenerate dragon. Yeah, people call them furries if I'm not mistaken. Right after this, we are presented to the orcs. Their tribe apparently has been guarding this temple ruins for generations. These guys are the actual most common enemy of the game, which is a good thing. I think they are one of the most fun enemies to fight against. This part is also where the game introduces the escort mechanic. I have seen some people that hate this, and I can see why. Liana is not a good fighter at all. Sometimes she can even help us with healing spells, but having to take care of ourselves and her is not viable. 
However, having to deal with this escort mechanic is completely optional. The game just does a very poor job at informing it through this small warning that disappears after 5 to 10 seconds. Why am I saying this was poorly communicated? Because the player most probably was occupied trying to spot the enemies in the area or even fighting them when the warning was triggered. From this point on, the game gets very straightforward. All those good things I said about the gameplay are still present, but the story itself starts to take long pauses. It's a classic, fun to play, but very boring to hear in a video, so the pace of this video will also be faster. After going through a tunnel infested with these strange and annoying creatures, we acquire the Hope Arrow. This introduces us to another very important mechanic of the game. Every time you fire an arrow from this bow into a plank of wood, it will spawn a rope that you can use to move around the map. Take this as a rule of thumb, every time you end up getting stuck or lost in an area, look up and search for a place where you can use this bow. After getting out of the tunnels, the Palkai appears to say hello and kills that wizard that was accompanying Liana since the beginning. We fight our way through until we get to the entrance of the temple, and here I think it's a good time to put this warning. Expect seeing spiders here, this place is very on the nose about it, there are at least 3 pieces of architecture I can show you to prove my point. This is not a mummy, it's a person stuck into a spider chrysalid. Yeah, I just realized I could just have shown you the name of this place. We kill some orcs, Liana doesn't help with shit, and we get to this big door. Here the game reveals to us why the Chantry Crystal is so important. Apparently, a lot of spells were used to keep this door closed, and they are only deactivated when the crystal is put in its place. The Palkai appears and we have to face him. Okay, it's not exactly face him head on. We have to attract him to this particular and close the gate on top of him. However, I spent a long time firing arrows at him. I was going to say this fight is shit, and the game did a poor job at communicating what I had to do, but I have just seen the recording that Liana literally said what I had to do. I was just not paying attention to anything she said. Now what are you doing out of the kitchen? Oh, my mistake! Remember what I told you, sweetie! Why is that kissing? Not talking! After killing the Palkai, we get to a big chunk of filler story-wise, until we are able to open this door. However, some great gameplay parts are in here. This part right here is where the game starts to throw spiders at you as if there is no tomorrow. You can skip a good chunk of it by running and jumping at the right time. But it's not enough to avoid it now. These ones you have to face. I understand some people have a problem with this, so I will only show the footage with the mod on. After killing them, we make our way up by using the rope and arrow, until we find this disgusting web filled hole. I'm not going up there. I'm not going out there. <laughs> I'm definitely. Oh. Sorry, bro. Two weeks from retirement. Good luck! This is just the game trying to fool you. There is actually no spiders here. It would be too obvious, and the game will throw them at you when you are least expecting. Getting out of the cave, we get to the place where the goblins close the gate at our face. Goblins are extremely weak individually, and we won't try to face you when there is more than one of them around. Even in a big number, these two are very easy to deal with, meaning that you can go to town on them. The game throws its first cyclops at us, this fight is optional and for a good motive. At this point, the player will probably not have any effective way of fighting him. These guys are not exactly a problem to deal with. They are extremely dumb and will stop following you the second they can't access the same place you are. You can see what I mean in the footage I'm showing. The best way to deal with them is by using traps, but they stop being a problem on the second you acquire an indestructible shield. I'm saying this because I only tried to face one of them using the shield in the literal last mission of the game, because I assumed the shield would be useless against an enemy this size. But apparently, Seraph is on god mode as long as a shield is up. We make our way to this giant cliff, and this is probably the moment you will realize two things, one of them being that despite being almost 18 years old, this game still looks pretty good. And the second one is that you are going to spend a lot of time in this temple. There is that iconic staircase by the cliffside that everyone uses in their reviews, and there is a motive for that. Not only it looks good, it also feels very good to kick orcs down the stairs. Right after it, we have the elevator we need to use to access the crystal pedestal, but this is also where many legs expedition got obliterated, and before the diet, some genius decided to stop the elevator mechanism. I know this doesn't count as a fetch quest, because we are not going to fetch any items, but it sure sounds like a fetch quest when you write about it. This game is lucky that its gameplay feels so good. I'm not even going to complain they put the same excuse for extending its time twice in a row. To access these mechanisms, we need to go up the stairs that we can only reach using the rope arrow. Up there we find some orcs in a barricaded house. This is another segment the game decides to throw spiders at us. However, we can jump this whole segment and not face them at all. There is some good loot in this house, but I think this is just the devs flipping us off. 
because the second you try to reach for it, the whole house goes down the hill. Everything I tried resulted in the same thing. If there is a way to reach these items, please share it in the comments. Through the barricaded house, we gain access both to this forge and the elevator mechanisms. Here we can use that fire gold bar to create the earth fighter sword. After activating the mechanisms, we have to track back our way to the elevator. Some goblins will appear, but they are no challenge. On the top floor of the elevator, there will be some spiders and finally, the crystal pedestal. After placing the Shinchiri crystal in its pedestal, we are surprised by the orc chief. If you go to this point and still has not dominated the combat of this game, let's just say that you will be watching this cutscene right here a lot. One of the things you can try to do is to kick him every time it looks like he's going to charge a sword attack. The other orcs will honor their chief last vow. It's only a shame that I was really playing as Evil Seraph, so everyone died. Compared with the Orc Chief, every other combat in this game is a cakewalk. So in terms of difficulty, this was the peak of the game. We go through a shortcut that leads us directly back to Liana. The game has some nice interactions with her here. If at any time, during this last segment you come back to her chamber, she will heal Seraph back to full health and say that she's relieved that he's okay. I think that they only needed to give her a little more screen time with moments like this before making her express her feelings towards Seraph. Or maybe create some situation where she could help Seraph in parallel while interacting with him. But no, instead we are close to see the end of Liana's most relevant screen time, because right after opening this door for us, this happens. We have no way to go back and help her, our only choice now is to keep going and find the School of Shadows. I think this next part is the worst of the game. Again, we have to deal with another filler segment, but this time not one of the things that made the last one interesting are present. Being honest, fighting only against these simple zombies is not fun. It would be if they did not spam this Poison Cloud spell every time you get too close to one of them. We will also have to face two or three ghouls in this part. Fighting against them is fun, and maybe it's just me, but I think they did an excellent job with their animations. They pass a feeling that you are dealing with a very angry wild animal. The main objective for this segment is for us to acquire three stones so we can put them in this spider statue. The first stone is in a chest down the statue room. Try shooting an arrow in the glowing spider symbol to disarm the trap. Every time you put a stone in the statue, a short cutscene with Xana will trigger, with only the last one really being relevant. I will highlight only two more things because even talking about this segment is boring. Every time you feel as if the room is spawning an infinite number of zombies, it's because this is exactly what's happening. Do not try to fight against them, just run around until you find an exit. Pay attention to the walls in this room, I lost myself after I did not notice this mechanism on the wall. There was only two times in the game that I can remember right now where they used this shit contraption. The second stone is that yellow thing in the wall. You have to use the rope arrow to get it. I spent a good amount of time lost looking for this thing and it was right on my face. With this shit part over, the game from now on will start to peak, right after we get the School of Shadows. Before it happens, we have to interact with the spider goddess and tell her to fuck off. She obviously gets pissed and sends the wave of spiders after us. We have to kill at least 10 of them to pass this part. As I said, their combat is one of the worst parts of the game, but I forgot to mention they also give you the poisoned stats. So I hope you're stuck in those antidote potions the game was giving you before. Let's be frank, you probably used them fighting against those zombies outside. So consider this another moment the game tells you to go fuck yourself. Thankfully, after all this, we get one of the best cutscenes in the game.
thousand years, Zareth, since the seventh dragon banished our kind from the face of Ashtar. For ten centuries, we have waited for our vengeance. We have waited for you. You are the one foretold by the wizard Sarshazar, the dark messiah of ancient prophecy. You are my son and my heir, the herald of fire and of blood. The creature that accompanies you is you. Use her as you see fit. Now, take up the skull of my ancient enemy and shatter the prison that holds me. This, my son, I command you. And, once I am free, this world and every soul in it will be. Shadows is not for the likes of you, Demon Spawn. The seventh dragon did not sacrifice himself so that some demon's bastard could undo all his labors. I do this for the sake of all Ashan. The prophecy of the Dark Messiah ends here. This is the scene I had in mind when talking about Xana. At first, I thought she was also manipulating this memory, because KBLF was actually treating Seraph almost as an equal, making only one demand at the end. I was expecting the greatest of demon lords to be way more arrogant than this. I think this would be a great plot twist, but I got to say, making him charismatic and actually wanting to share his power with Seraph was a great call. I also like the fact that Tarantir does not fuck around, the second he gets the opportunity he goes for the kill. As you probably noticed, we still have some time of video, so we know Seraph's story continues after this. My prince, my messiah, and arise. Seraph, my love, can you hear me? Uh, what happened? Parentir killed you. I used the energy of the skull to revive you. I feel different. Not surprising. We're joined even more closely, and some of my powers are yours to command. Where's Aaron? Gone with the skull. We'll have to hurry to stop him. Stop him? I'm going to kill him. Oh, the orcs took all your equipment. They thought you were dead. Let's show them that they've made a little mistake. The game gives us the demon form. While you're using it, our HP will go down until we cause damage to some enemy. Our objective now is to get out of this island and go after Arantir, who's probably back in Stonehelm now that he has the School of Shadows. If you consider this whole island segment as Act 2, with the exception of some parts, Act 2 has been a huge fucking filler. On its majority the gameplay was pretty solid, so I can't complain about it. This is more because of personal taste, but I hate tempo in desert segments in almost any game. Usually I go through them because of the story, a thing that was clearly not the focus here. I think Act 2 was way weaker than Act 1, a good portion of its time could be used to evolve characters and plot. Instead, counting with this one, we had 3 filler segments with one of them being bad even on the murder of gameplay. However, even if I take all of those things into account, this game still managed to hold me through all that using only its gameplay. And with the exception of the spider statue segment, I would be more than willing to do it again. At the end of Act 2, the game starts to do something interesting with Xana's character. First. With a small amount of subtlety, she tries to manipulate Seraph into betraying his father, and getting the school for himself right after we kill this undead Cyclops. Magnificent! Killing a Cyclops! Such potency! My wonderful Seraph, you are a worthy heir to your father, and a worthy successor. We pass through another spider nest, end up into a goblin prison, and after all that, we have to run before this big guy kills us. After this, there's a segment where you have to stand still in this plank, while this pit is filled with water. Naturally, if you don't figure out fast enough where the contraption that fills the pit with water is, you'll be swarmed by the spiders that are on the walls. 
My only complaint here is that right before I get out of the island, they dropped the ball of the sub part and had Xana being extremely direct about betraying KBLF. Breathtaking, isn't it? And once you recover the skull and free your father, it will all be yours. Perhaps even without your father. One impossible quest at a time, Xana. Yes, my prince. I mean, I think they were pretty obvious in the first time. They should have simply trusted the player's intelligence. In many times I feel as if the writers wanted to do something more daring with the plot, but decided that it was best to play it safe, which is understandable, this was Arcane's second game and first big opportunity. Still, it's a very good thing they are using this character the way it was supposed to be used in the manner they presented it. It's even refreshing to see something like this, especially if you take into account the absolute dogshit writing we are seeing in all medias in the most recent years. The truth, my love. I didn't think so. I'm sorry. She's dead. Arantir killed her. Then we're lost. We should take the ship and flee. Maybe the Silver Cities. No. Have you seen Arantir? He lifted anchor and left the island. Damn. When? Hours ago. We didn't stop him because we were waiting for you and the skull. Sheox Gates! Arantir's got it, hasn't he? Yes, he has the skull. I'm going back to Stonehelm, to the Necromancer Lairs under the city. And when I get there, I will find Arantir and kill him. My lord, we will follow you. And so you begin to build your army. This is one of the moments I just mentioned. This makes me think that this game was being made with the intention of being way longer than it is. Or that they were setting up some things for a possible sequel. Unfortunately, it never happened. We appear immediately on the sewers before the portal to Arantir's hideout. We face some guards and enter this portal with a... Peculiar shape. This place is called Harash. It's the Necromancer's hideout and by far the place with the most interesting architecture in the game. Facing this common black guard that uses to give us a lot of trouble after so much time feels like a well-deserved power fantasy. The game even introduces the Vampire Knights, a new type of enemy way stronger and faster than the black guards. I can see them give you a lot of trouble if you have not upgraded Seraph with a strategy in mind. There are many things we discover here, one of them being that the necromancers are using ghouls to feed a massive spider they keep in their basement. We also discover that Lian is alive. Well, that was quick, my thoughts and prayers will be with the family. I'm just kidding, this is the type of death I would not wish on my worst enemy. Of course we are going to save her. The Spider Queen itself is not a challenge, I think she didn't even cause me any damage in the fight. If it was not for the mods, there would be between 3 to 5 spiders helping her. After this fight, there will be no more spiders in the game, however, I use the word spider so much in this video that I think YouTube will be giving you some wild recommendations from now on. We save Liana, and she says that she can feel the demonic corruption in Seraph. She points us to a priest in Stonehelm, so we can be purified. Before taking the elevator out of here, we discover Arantir's plans hanging around completely exposed in his room. I was going to criticize the game here, but they did establish right at the beginning that Arantir keeps records of his thoughts. This is another brief encounter with Liana. She stays behind in order to close the weirdly shaped Necromancer portal. I think this was another wasted opportunity. They could have put Xan aside for a while and given Liana some much needed attention during Act 3, but this is the last time we will see her before the end of the game. Your heritage, your destiny. Indeed. I 
seem to be surrounded by women who want things from you. The Necromancer army started a major attack and we now have to fight our way through the city until we can reach the Necropolis inside the Citadel Fortress. This part of the game to me is both the most memorable and ironically the most linear. Many parts of it will be basically you fighting waves of ghouls and necromancers. Listen, I have no problem with a game being linear. The problem is when all interesting is done. I see a linear game has an opportunity for the devs to really focus on the quality of it. Of course, the best of both worlds would be for a game to be good both in quantity and quality of its content. This should be where AAA games would enter. It's curious though that this game, which people now condemn for being linear and generic, is far more memorable and enjoyable than the majority of the grey, soulless blobs the industry calls AAA gaming these days. I think there is some things to highlight here, with only two of them being really important to the game's narrative. First being that, if you're playing as a warrior, you will be able to face the Cyclops head-on with one of the indestructible shields. If you're playing as a rogue, this fight might turn out to be kind of boring. You can easily exploit this fight if you stay in this cover here. It just takes a while. Turns out that there is also a trapdoor here. I forgot to check if it just skips the fight, but my best bet is that it does. The second is one of the things that are important for the narrative. In truth, this to me is the most important moment of this game. I have a huge rumbling about this subject alone. But I know not everyone will want to hear all that, so I will leave it for after the story of the game is over. Here is when you have to decide if you are going to purify Seraph. The differential here being how the game presents this option. You were already introduced to it 20 to 30 minutes before you got here. And to take it, you immediately have to walk down the end of this path right here. The priest Liana talked about will receive you. And now, all you need to do is to walk down this hallway and cleanse yourself. However, it's not that simple. Xana will try to bargain and put up a fight. You will be rewarded with three of the four most powerful weapons in the game if you get cleansed. It. This is the way of the game compensating you for not being able to use the demon form again. When you look at this just for the option alone, and the actions you execute in the game, it's a very simple thing. You just walk it from point A to point B. But if you play at this game, you know how cool was the way the game delivered this option. It basically passes its entirety building this up, no matter what you do, it has consequences. This being that you will lose either Xana or Liana. This is why I persisted on talking about how Liana's character could be better explored, because it would add much more weight in this decision. Again, all this is pretty simple, but besides the cutscenes and gameplay, this is one of the things that lives rent free in the brains of almost everyone that played this game. Here, I will keep showing the recording of my first run. In this one, I decided not to purify Seraph. We fight our way inside the citadel and are surprised by another Palkai. Yeah, this one I can criticize. The only viable way you can defeat it is by using this Ballista. I appreciate that the devs try to do something different here. But this fight feels like a cheap 3D knockoff of Space Invaders. We have to use this mechanism on the opposite side of the Ballista and open the door that will take us to the gates of the Necropolis. Here is where we will face the consequences of our actions. If you simply leave Liana behind in the spider pit, she would return here as a leech. If you purified yourself, she will pat you on the back, then say that you have done the right thing. Then she would immediately piss off because the writers apparently refuse to give her any screen time. In our case, she will call us out for not getting rid of the demon corruption and will try to kill us. People say that she is bossy because of this whole purifying situation, but I have to defend her on this one. If most people were in her place and knew that someone is probably about to murder fuck the entire world, they would also react in a really hostile manner too. Honestly, now I just feel bad. Usually I just blow up whatever's in my way, but with you, I've gotten kind of attached. It's sort of like putting down old space yeller. After this, we descend into the necropolis. Right at the entrance, we are surprised by the ghost of an imprisoned prince. He says Arantir had the reason four of the old kings of this place to use them as guards while he finishes his plans with the school of shadows. He says that one of them is his father, and that he can give us his mark, so his father can see us as allies when the time comes. To free him, we just need to break these two chains holding his body. I can see where they wanted to go with this. They wanted us to see how big the necropolis is, and also wanted for us to explore it a little bit. 
This might be just with me, but I wish they used another way to do this. All I wanted to see now was Arantir's fight, and a last moment side quest was really something unnecessary. The worst part of it is that completing it will only matter if you are role playing, because gameplay wise, these four leeches representing the four kings are not a challenge at all. After all that, we have yet another segment that to me feels like a last minute filler, with another cyclops fight. Jumping through this wall, we finally get to the end of the game. If you are doing Liana's path, she will appear right now for the final confrontation. If you are worried about having to take care of her during the final fight against Iron Tear, I think you'll be relieved to know that she hides until the fight is over. I only discovered that these star case is here because of her. On my first run, I thought there was no direct way to go down, so I used the completely unnecessary way that I made with the Hope Arrow. Down there, we find Iron Tear accompanied by a Necromancer and a Vampire Knight. You can and should defeat both of them before triggering Iron Tear's fight. I really like the character they built for Iron Tear. Maybe I should play Heroes 5 again and actually try to understand the game's campaigns. Speaking of which, KBLF also has a campaign that came, but the few things I have read about it, YouTube would not like very much if I describe this one in detail. So let's just say that it has something to do with Seraph's birth and his mother. She did not give KBLF her consent. It's over. Give me the skull or I'll take it from your corpse. Silence, boy. You have no idea of what is at stake here. We understand quite well, my love. What is at stake is our future. A few lives for an entire world. Quite a bargain. This final fight with Arantir has two phases. One of them is interesting, however, it's not hard at all. But at least the game delivers the fight it passes so much time building up. Arantir will throw fireballs, summon undead, and use invisibility to try to get some distance from us. In the second part, he summons a skeleton dragon. And, as you probably already guessed, it's awful. The idea of the final boss of the game being a dragon is good on paper. I mean, it does sound really cool. There's a motive a lot of games use this cliché. But the execution here is not good at all. Despite this place being massive, it still doesn't seem like there is enough room for a dragon to fly. His attacks are easy to dodge, although in this case this is a good thing. If the attacks were also hard to dodge, this fight would go from bad to infuriating. After dealing enough damage to the dragon, Arantir will try to resummon it, and his shield will be turned off. This is where we can deal damage to him. I think this fight would be much better if they put a really powerful humanoid enemy here, like a death knight. Fighting against humanoid enemies is where the majority of the combat in the game was grounded, and is also where it shines. So, these are two good reasons of why they should have kept it for the final fight of the game. After Arantir says his last words, we can make the final decision of the game. The game has 4 finals in total, but the animations are basically the same for 2 of them, with the only differential being if you choose Xana or Liana. If you choose Xana and free Seraph's father, the prophecy of the Dark Messiah will be complete. To free him, you just have to take the School of Shadows to the end of this hallway. If you just put the school back in the pedestal and choose Xana, Seraph will betray his father, but the full power of the relic will remain untouched. Plus, I'm almost certain Xana will betray you the second she gets the chance. If you choose Liana and free Seraph's father, KBLF will kill her. Just like in real life, you will have no bitches. But your dad will be grateful. If you choose Liana and betray Seraph's father, you will have what can be considered the good ending lore. In practice, you condemn Seraph to pass the rest of his life with Liana. Century of blood and strife. The moon shall darken and none know why. 
the resting place at last is found of the seventh who soared so high. Thus, come to me, my son and savior. I have done your bidding, my master. Here is your son delivered to you. Son, someday I shall thank you for your fealty. Or hell shall echo with your screams of devotion. So, Father, I give you your freedom. Rejoice, my son. Do the eventual bend us unto our will, or break it to pieces. I raise my arms, and for the first time in centuries, no chains bind them! From darkness comes the light of flame. The demon lord by his hand was freed. Sovereigns both, they claimed the world as Sarshazar had prophesied. I decided to make this video about Dark Messiah because of an article I have seen some time ago. It called this game, quote unquote, horny, generic, linear, and unbalanced. To be frank, Story-wise, the game is in fact horny and generic. Gameplay-wise, the game is linear and unbalanced, yet people still love it and remember it fondly. The answer to this is something the industry found out some time ago, and it's one of the reasons the majority of the AAA games looks and feels the same. Movies and video games are both distinct types of media, with the difference that movies already have a well-grounded and established way of storytelling. However, it looks like video games still are mostly in the dark on the subject of how to best use its assets to tell a story. Except that, some games did find out how to do it, the answer being immersive sims. You can see this with some other examples like The First Deus Ex, Fifth, Dishonored, and The Witcher series. All these games are focused on how the player interacts with the world, by his actions and choices. The most interesting part of it all being how the world and the story will react to the player. Basically this is why I said this is the best way to tell a story in a video game. You will be obligated to use all the assets of this media while trying to achieve this effect. This is kind of an untold consensus in the industry. This is why all AAA games feel the same. They started with the same objective in mind, then desperately try to appeal to anything that is more profitable at the time. The concept of what an immersive sim is, is not simple to define, and is also an extremely difficult thing to achieve. There is a motive this genre is known for killing studios. But when done right, even if your game has a simple story, people will remember it fondly, because that will feel like their story, their choices and consequences. This is why when a game tells a story as if it was trying to be a movie, even if the story itself is great, you feel as if something is missing. Dark Messiah's story is generic and simple, but this game achieved something few games could. It told its story as a video game story should be told. I find this theme very interesting, but I don't know if you guys want to watch a whole video about this. If you do find this idea interesting, please leave a comment. As always, consider liking and subscribing. Stay tuned, there will be more to come soon.